What's up, y'all? I think I'm live. I am live on Facebook. My light needs to be a little bit better. Looks like my face is still kind of in shadow. Okay. All right. I'm live on Facebook. I'm letting my group of folks know that I'm live now. Okay. I have a I have a messenger group that I always alert when I'm on live in case I don't get a notification. Okay, so just letting my group know. I know this is Easter Sunday. Happy Easter. For uh, everybody that's celebrating Easter, which should be every believer, because <clears throat> Easter Sunday is a cornerstone of our faith. Okay, I know there's been all the emphasis on the cross, but the cross is the first part of the well, Jesus' birth is the first part of the process, of course, but on the cross, he died for our sins, but that work is not complete without the resurrection. Because if Jesus dies, He's still like everybody else because everybody dies. And if Jesus is raised from the dead, he's still like a smaller group of people because there have been more than one person that died and came back. Jesus was resurrected from the dead, okay, which means raised to die no more, which means that death has no power over him, which means he can't die again. So that's significant. That's the cornerstone of our faith. That's what separates Christianity from everything else. The fact that we have a Savior that came back from the grave and beat death itself. And then through his victory over death, grants that same victory to everybody that believes in him. That's what separates Christianity from other faiths, is that our Savior, our leader, actually demonstrated his power over death, over sin, over the grave, over every enemy of God and every enemy of mankind. He actually showed that none of those things could actually stop him and keep him in the ground. That's what separates Christianity from other faiths, if you didn't know that, okay? Uh, just about every other faith that I personally have studied deals with works. The way they deal with sin is to say there's something you can do to work your way out of the penalty of sin. And normally that has to do with good deeds, high morals, high ethics. Some people believe it's by skin color, <laughs> okay? And most people believe that sexuality has something to do with whether or not you know God or not. But if any of that were true, then that would mean you could stop yourself from aging. If any of that was true, that would mean that you would never have to die. If any of that were true, that means you could stick your finger in the face of death, in the face of aging, in the face of everything, and say, you can't take me, you can't touch me, you can't affect me, that different kind of thing. Because if it were by works, there's my sister. Because if it were by works, that would mean that you would have worked enough to pay off the debt. That's what that means if salvation was really uh, uh, actually by works. And that's what most other faiths besides Christianity say, that there's something you can do, some type of code you have to live by, a moral or ethical code or good works that you do that that is what makes you right with God. But if that were true, that would mean that people that lived by that code or kept the law or did whatever could stop themselves from aging. They would never die because they would have paid for their sins. So the only reason we die is because of sin. So if you could actually do it by works, if there was actually a moral code you could live by, which is so many other faiths posit that because of the keeping of certain commandments, that that's what makes you right with God, then you could stop yourself from aging and you wouldn't have to go to the grave. Think about it. Because you'd be free from the penalty of sin because you paid it off. You don't have to pay the debt twice if you paid it off with your morals. So that's how we know because Jesus bodily resurrected from the grave and because he physically died, that there's nothing we could do to actually pay that debt. He's the only one that paid the debt because his blood was sinless. And because his blood was sinless, that means the sins he died for were not his own. So that means that death and the grave and sin and hell and the devil had no legal right to keep Jesus 
in the underworld to keep Jesus in the afterlife. That's why he was able to come back and become the firstborn from the dead. Okay, if you don't really understand what Easter is about, Easter is about, hey, Lisa's there, hey, amen, Lisa. So that's what Easter is about. Um, it's about the fact that we have a savior that beat all of those enemies at their own game and legally, was legally able to say to sin, uh, and sin is anything that does not conform to God. Anything that's not God is sin. Death is the penalty for sin. The grave is where your body goes. Hell is where your soul goes, okay? And Satan is the accuser. He's the prosecuting, prosecuting attorney that brings the list of all the things you've done wrong and accuses you before God and sells God according to your own penalty, the wages of sin is death. So this person must die because of this sin, blah, 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 blah. And we're all guilty. So the reason that the Lord was able to beat all that is because he wasn't just found not guilty. He wasn't even found innocent. The Lord was found without fault. I find no fault, no flaw in this man. So in other words, the Lord had no darkness in him, no sin in him, no sin in his thoughts, no sin in his words, no sin in his motives, in his heart, and no sin in his deeds. So when he died, it became obvious that the sins he died for were not his own, they were ours. So there was no legal right that all the enemies had from God to keep Jesus in the underworld. That's why he was able to get up and take the keys of hell and death because he had to be compensated because his death was unjust. You understand? So never let anybody tell you that our faith doesn't have real life consequences. That is just some type of emotional rosology. That's not true. It's legal. It's a covenant. It's a contract. It's physical. It's practical. It's observable. Okay. So that's what resurrection, that's not my prophetic word. I'm just explaining. That's what resurrection Sunday is about. That the legal penalty of sin is death. That is why we age. That's why there's poverty and sickness. That's why we die. And that's what the devil accuses us with, because that is God's law, that the wages of sin is death. So God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost had already worked out a way to satisfy the penalty and set us free at the same time. But that's why the Lord's death was so brutal, because somebody had to pay. So that's why the Lord's death was so brutal, but that's why they could not legally keep him. That's what this day is about him coming back from the underworld, having preached to all the people that were down there that he was Messiah and taking the keys of hell and death out of their hands and said, these are legally mine now because I was killed unjustly. All the sins I died for were not mine, so there must be a recompense. See that? It's brilliant. You can't outsmart God. You can't outthink the maker. The plan is brilliant, but it's costly. It caused Jesus a brutal death. People always say that Jesus gave his life he did give his life, but he it was a brutal death. It wasn't like he was shot. He was arrested and beaten and spit upon and beaten some more and beaten until he didn't look human anymore. And then they plucked his beard out. And they spit all over him and they beat him up until he didn't look like a person anymore. They arrested the Lord in the garden and beat him that night. Then they went to sleep. Then they woke up the next day and beat him some more in the morning Then put him on the cross at nine o'clock in the morning, if you didn't know that. Jesus was crucified at nine o'clock in the morning and he stayed on the cross until three o'clock in the afternoon, six hours. And during those six hours, <clears throat> the devil was emptying everything into his body, uh, every payment for sin, every torment, every sickness, every demon, everything had their way with Jesus on the cross, which is why his death was so brutal. So that the Lord could pay for what we deserve. You understand? So that's what today is about. If, if you never heard it explained to you, that's what Resurrection Sunday or Easter is about. Him coming back from that because they had no legal right to keep him because those sins were ours and not his. Understand? All right. Let's dive into our prophetic word for today. That's not the word for today. It's just an explanation about what today is about. If it was never explained to you in practical terms, if you don't know why as Christians, and also you can't go by the American calendar. Because by the American way, we celebrate Christmas more than anything else because Christmas is commercialized. We should, of course, celebrate the birth of Christ. My father told me once when I was young, he's like, why do you think you're supposed to get presents? It's Jesus' birthday. It ain't your birthday. <laughs> Woo, that sounds just like my dad. But anyway, 
Um, so we focus more on Christmas than in their other thing, but it's actually the crucifixion of Christ, Holy Week, the Passion of Christ, and resurrection that distinguishes Christianity from all other faiths. It's the fact that Jesus got out the grave that's the key element of all that. Because again, if Jesus dies, he's just like everybody else, because everybody dies. If Jesus is raised from the dead, other people were raised from the dead, they died again. Jesus was resurrected. He was raised to die no more. That's what today is about. You ought to be able to articulate that to anyone that's not a Christian. Okay? You ought to be able to articulate what Resurrection Sunday is about in your own words because you understand why you're able to be saved. You're able to be saved because all of the stuff you've done wrong in your life and all of the stuff that you will do wrong in your life has been covered with a payment by someone else. So that's why you get forgiveness and you get interest into the kingdom because somebody else paid your way in. You need to be able to explain that because no other faith has a savior that came back from the grave with proof of the payment of the penalty. Understand? Okay, we're we gonna get into the prophetic word because I can stay right there on Easter. All right, there's Donna, he's my cousin Donna. Hey Donna, God bless you. All right. <clears throat> So let's say a prayer, and then here we go. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for giving us understanding, even though we, we will never fully understand. We'll spend all of eternity, oh God, understanding your great grace and your great love, Father God, and Lord Jesus Christ. The love that you have for us is beyond description. It's beyond anything human. It's divine. And I just want to thank you for that great love that blows my mind every day. And thank you, thank you, Jesus, for going through with the sacrifice because you didn't have to. But thank you for going through with the sacrifice, oh God, to, to take the penalty in your body so we could be free, so that we could become a part of your kingdom and live forever. That's only because of you, Jesus, because we have no legal right to anything outside of you because you're the only one that paid. So I just want to thank you for being saved. I want to thank you for giving me that level of understanding. I look forward to all that we're going to learn in the days to come. But I just want to worship you on this Resurrection Sunday for the sacrifice you paid. So fill me with the Holy Ghost. I must decrease or you must increase. I crucify myself. Get me out of the way. Breathe through me right now. Let the Spirit of God take over so that whatever is said is what you want said. So you might be glorified so that the saints might be edified. The demons might be terrified. And unbelievers might be challenged to turn from their way and to turn to you because you're the only one that has life, both in this life and the life to come. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And I declare and decree that signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this word. And those that believe in and receive it shall receive signs, wonders, and miracles as a testimony to the truth of God from the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, here we go. Today's prophetic word is running for my life. That's the kind of an old school black people phrase, running for my life. But I explained to you, I will explain to you from the scripture what it means. So let's go to our first scripture and we'll get some insight from the Holy Ghost about uh, what he wants us to learn. Okay. All right. First scripture we're going to look at is <clears throat> Hebrews 12 and 2. So let me put that on the screen. Hebrews 12 and 2. Hebrews 12 and 2. That's the first scripture that we're going to look at. And I'm going to read from several different translations like I always do. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hebrews 12 1. <laughs> I knew something was off. Hebrews 12 1. I'm sorry. So let me get rid of that. Hebrews 12, 1. I had Hebrews 12, 2 up because I think I'm going to reference it as well. But we're going to start at Hebrews 12, 1. I'm sorry, my mistake. Hebrews 12, 1. Several different translations. Okay. New International Version. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Berean Study Bible. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with endurance the race set out for us. <clears throat> English Standard Version. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight 
and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Okay, so let's break down what that means. When it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what that means is that Hebrews chapter 11 is called the faith chapter. And what that is, is it's a listing of so many people in the Bible that overcame their challenges because they believed God. For example, Abraham and Sarah always wanted to have kids naturally, but then they got old and they got past their ability to conceive kids naturally. But because they believed God, they were able to have a baby when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. Samson, because he believed God, was able to get super strength and was able to kill a thousand Philistines by himself. King David, because he believed God, was able to go from being a shepherd and a musician to actually being king over Israel. Joseph, because he believed God and because he hung in there, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, by his family, and God ended up lifting him up to being the prime minister of Egypt. Joseph was over the entire economy of Egypt during the time, and he was second only to Pharaoh. Okay, He was the number two man to the Pharaoh of Egypt during that day. This is way before Moses. This is 400, 450 years before Moses. Okay? So the Bible is talking about how, uh, and people like the one lady who, uh, who uh, creditors were coming to get her kids, and she got the miracle from Elijah for the oil to flow, but also uh, her son died later, or there's another widow whose son died, and Elisha brought that child back to life because of faith. So Hebrews chapter 11 spends the entire chapter talking about people that got promises from God, overcame their challenges because they believed God because of their faith. So Hebrews 12 and 1 starts off by saying, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. In other words, there's a whole bunch of people that have lived on earth and been through the same kind of stuff you've been through, but they made it. I stopped by to tell you, it's not just the people in the Bible. It's the people in your family and the people in your church that you knew that have died. They're watching us from heaven too. Did you know that? So like in my case, my grandmother, uh, my aunts, my dad, my uncle, uh, all the people that I went to church with when I was a little boy, the people that knew and loved the Lord, they're watching us from heaven. So it's not just the people in the Bible. And when we die, we'll be watching our children and grandchildren from heaven. Okay, so it's not just people in the Bible, it's actually people you know. People that you grew up in church with that tried to encourage you in the Lord, that prayed for you, that loved the Lord and served God in their lifetime, they're watching us now, cheering us on, telling us to be encouraged because they made it so we can make it. There's some more stuff going on too, but I don't want to get too deep in that because that's a rabbit hole. But yeah, there's an afterlife existence in the people that lived on earth that have died and gone to the glory realm are cheering us on. They're watching us from the balcony of heaven, telling us that we can make it because they made it, if you didn't know that. So that's what the cloud of witnesses is talking about. But then it says, let us throw off every encumbrance or every weight or everything that hinders or everything that slows us down, okay? So what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. So think about it like a marathon runner or think about it like a sprinter. When you run a marathon or when you sprint, what do you have? When you have on as few clothes as possible, you have on very thin shorts and you have on a tank top or maybe even a half tank top. Because when you run, you wanna be aerodynamically able to cut through the air and cut through the wind resistance as easily as possible. You can't do that when you have on heavy clothing. You can't do that when you have on a bunch of things. When you're running for speed or distance or endurance, or you're running just to finish, then there's some stuff you have to shed. That's what that's talking about. So if you've ever sprinted or you ever run 50 yard dash, 100 yard dash, marathon, if you've ever done any type of running at any point in your life, you didn't want anything weighing you down because that would cut your speed and increase your time. That's the same way it works in life. If you want practical examples, because remember I told you I always teach practically. If you want practical examples, bitterness is one of the things that will slow you down. Like if you're bitter all the time, bitterness, if bitterness takes root inside of you, it actually makes you age faster. It makes you age harder and sometimes can take you out early. Another thing that can weigh you down is unforgiveness. Like if you have nef never forgiven people that did you wrong, but also if you've never forgiven yourself. So like if you keep rehearsing your mistakes, 
that's going to weigh you down. That's going to slow you down. That's also going to push people away from you. If all you're ever talking about is, what was me? I did this 20 years ago. I made this mistake. People are going to get tired of that. So unforgiveness will weigh you down. Uh, another thing that will weigh you down is uh, pessimism. Negative thinking is if when you look out at life, all you see is the bad. Because there's good and bad in life. There's beauty and ugliness in life. There's life and death in life. Okay, there's good and evil in life. But if all when you look at life is all you ever see is the bad, that's going to weigh you down. You have a pessimist, pessimistic or negative view. That's what that kind of stuff he's talking about. And then the Bible goes on to say, the sin that so easily entangles us, the sin that so easily slows us down, the sin which clings so closely, the King James says, uh, the sin which does so easily beset us. What is that talking about? Okay, because we need to have a practical understanding of these words. What is that talking about? That's talking about your sinful habits. That's talking about sin in your life. That's talking about things that that you have a natural pro proclivity for and or things that you learn how to do. Like if you're a liar and if you've been lying for 30 years, like every time you open your mouth, you've been lying. Every time you turn around, you lie. You need to learn how to stop lying and tell the truth. Uh, if you have any type of substance abuse, you love to get lit, you love to get high, that's going to slow you down. That's going to cost you a lot of money, if nothing else, if you've got a substance abuse habit. Uh, bad relationships. If you just keep picking the wrong people, that's going to slow your life down. That's going to weigh you down. Uh, bad temper. If Now, everybody loses their temper sometimes. I'm talking about if you're always going off. <laughs> if every time you turn around, you're just going off. That kind of thing, that's going to slow you down. See, that's the kind of thing that gets you tangled. Debt. Debt gets you tangled. Bad financial habits. Uh, bad diet. Bad nutritional habits that get you tangled up. Because if you don't take care of your body, what ends up happening is you end up becoming a prisoner in your own body. You can't do the stuff you want to do because you don't have the health to do it. That is the stuff, that's the sin that's a part of our lives. You see what I mean? And that's the kind of stuff that we have to crucify every day. We can't overcome it on our own. We can only overcome it by uh, crucifying our flesh and filling ourselves with the word of God and filling ourselves with the Holy Spirit and letting the Lord take control. Because I know a lot of people, when they struggle with stuff, they can acknowledge the struggle, but they don't know how to get out. The only way you get out is you have to surrender. You can't beat it by yourself. You have to surrender. You have to give it to the Lord. You have to ask the Lord to become your Lord. And you have to let go of the Lordship rights to your life and give the Lordship rights to your life to Jesus. In other words, I'm no longer the boss of me. Jesus is now the boss of me. And instead of doing what I want, now I'm going to do what he wants. When you do that, you discover that the Lord gives you power to do what he wants you to do. That's why the Holy Spirit of God is here. So in other words, anything the Lord wants you to do, he doesn't expect you to do it on your own. If he wants you to stop doing something, he doesn't expect you to do that on your own. If he wants you to start doing something, he doesn't expect you to do that on your own. That's the beauty of Christianity, that whatever the Lord tells you to do, whatever he wants you to stop doing or start doing or whatever, he's going to empower you. That's why the Holy Spirit is here. That's the beauty of being a Christian. That's why I don't understand these believers that are saved, but they're not spirit-filled. What's the point of being saved if you ain't going to be spirit-filled, if you're not going to take full advantage of what it means to be born again? If you're going to get saved, and they just live like a natural person. What was the point? Just fire insurance so you don't have to go to hell when you die? If all God meant was for us to have fire insurance, we would get saved and die. But we do not get saved and die because there's a life God wants us to live. And that life is according to his purpose and his word and his Holy Spirit. So everything that's not that life has to be crucified, set aside, that we don't walk in that anymore so we can walk in the life that he wants us to walk in. That's why I'm sitting here prophesying to you now, because God called me to it, because this was not my idea. This is not what I wanted. It's not how I saw myself, even though if you're a prophet or apostle, you're born that way. This was not my idea. I wrestled with it. I struggled with it, okay? But I had to surrender. I had to learn how to say, not my will, but thine be done, and let God use me. Now I'm happy, because <laughs> I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade my prophetic ministry for anything now, but it wasn't always like that. I had to learn to crucify myself. 
crucify my flesh, crucify my self-will and say, Lord, I'm going to obey because you told me to do it. You see what I mean? So when the Bible is talking about laying aside those weights and the sin, that's what it means. So right now we're going to take a moment and we're going to pray in the spirit. OK, what we're going to do right now is we're going to let the Holy Spirit show you anything in your life that needs to be crucified. And I'm going to show you exactly what you do. You do not do this out loud. You do not have to confess in front of anybody. This is something you pray quietly to yourself and you pray in tongues. And as we pray in tongues, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit through our prayer language to reveal to us any weight, anything that we're carrying that's not from Christ. Here we go. Pray quietly in tongues. All right, Holy Ghost told me right away what I need to work on. Spoke it right to my spirit. I heard him in the spirit. Okay? So if you did that exercise we just did, then the spirit of God just revealed to you some weight that you're carrying that you need to get rid of. Okay? See, I told you this thing is practical. This has day-to-day -day application. This is not going bye-bye to some pie in the sky when you die. This is right here, right now. Okay? All right, let's go back to the scripture. And it says, the sin that so easily entangles, and here it is. Because the name of today's prophetic word is running, parenthesis for my life. Let us run with endurance the race set out for us. Oh, my word. First of all, it says, and let us run to run or to walk hastily in the Greek to run, okay? You got to run. That's why I used the analogy of a sprint or a marathon because the Christian life, sometimes you're sprinting, but most of the time the Christian life is a marathon because you got to walk with God every day as long as you're on this planet. That's not a sprint. You can't live all your days at once. That's what I'm saying. However many years you get, you can live all them years at the same time. You only live one moment at a time. You can't even live a day. People say one day at a time. Well, you're experiencing a 24-hour cycle, but you're experiencing that 24-hour cycle one moment at a time. Okay? So that's why it's a marathon. But you have to run it. Okay? You have to run it. Why do you have to run it? Later on in the verse, it gives the answer to that question. It says, run with endurance, the race set out for us. Okay? What does that mean? That means there's a personal plan for your life. That is why you cannot compare yourself to other people. Ever since I was a little boy, I've been hearing people talk about who was saved and who wasn't saved. I didn't understand it then, and I don't understand it now. How do you know who is and who is not saved? Uh, tell me right now, without looking it up, how many saved people in China? Tell me right now, without looking it up, how many saved people, how many Christians in Nigeria? Tell me right now without looking it up. How many saved people are in Japan? Right. Yeah, I thought you knew who was saved or not. That just amazes me. That's amazing me since I was a little boy. How you know? And people were all talking about this one ain't saved and that one ain't saved. The scripture says the foundation of the Lord standeth sure having this seal. The Lord knows those that are his. So, you, so my point is that you don't have to be worrying about who's right with God. This one ain't right, and I never liked them, and they this and they that. You don't have to worry about that. You have to worry about you. You have to work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling, okay? You make sure you say that's all you got to worry about because the plan that God has for you is personal. Now, here's the mistake that Christians make. This is going to look funny, but you're going to understand it. What's this right here? That's my elbow. One more time. What's this right here? That's my elbow. Which which way does my elbow bend? It bends towards me, which is why we can do curls. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Down in the middle of my leg, what do we call that? That's my knee. Which way does my knee bend? My knee bends away from me. It means back that way, right? What Christian people do and what religious people do is, religious people do is the elbow looks down at the knee and tells the knee, you ain't saved because you don't bend the way we do. <laughs> So elbow bend this way, knee bend that way, and now that's your body. It's the same body, 
but because you got one joint that works a certain way, you got another joint that works in the complete opposite direction. Now the elbow trying to tell the knee you ain't saved because you don't bend the way we do. That's what people do with all this denominationalism. That's why God took his mighty hand and tore it all down. That's why we go to church now, 20 people at the time, max. And that all that old stuff is torn down. And very few of us are interested in going back to that old system because all it did was divide people. And all it did was get us hooked on the traditions of men. If God has a plan for your life that makes you the elbow, then by all means, obey God and be the elbow. If you look down and you see the knee bending the opposite way that you bend, don't be talking about they ain't saved. They have a different plan from God. Can you understand that? That's why you, the Bible says in Hebrews 12 too, the first scripture I'll put up, you got to set your eyes on Jesus. You got to do what the Lord tells you to do. Okay, I'm a prophet. Okay, I'm not a pastor. I'm not saying God might not call me a pastor one day, never say never, but I'm not a pastor. Okay, what I have done in my life has always been with music. I work with choirs. I work with musical groups. I work with worship teams. I work with bands. That's what I do. Okay. So, but I've never passed at a church. So what I look like talking about what pastors are doing, what I know about that life, okay? So that's what I mean when I say, I'm trying to stay in my lane. I'm trying to be prophetic like the Lord told me to do. And whatever he told everybody else, not my business, okay? I need to stay focused on what he's trying to get me to do. So that's why that's another entanglement that people get caught up in, okay? You're just so worried. Well, they're not living right. So what? How are you living? Well, this that, that ain't right for them to do that. So what? What you doing? Didn't we just do an exercise? We asked the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what we need to work on for the Spirit of God to bring conviction of sin, for the Spirit of God to show us how we need to grow. Didn't we just do that? That's what you need to be worried about, what the Holy Ghost just told you. And if you don't know how to do what I just did, that means you need some more growth in the body. You don't know how to invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit within you and get him to reveal to you, what do I need to do to be more pleasing in the eyes of Christ? That's what you need to worry about. Because as the scripture says, the race is set out before you. The race is set out before you. Now here, I got to take a little detour. It's not really a detour, but I got I to gotta bring in something else because it's going to help a lot of you. It's going to bless a lot of y'all. Okay, check the scripture out. Check out Hebrews 2 and 10. Berean Study Bible says, And bringing many sons to glory was fitting for God, for whom and through him all things exist, to make the author of their salvation, that's Jesus, perfect through suffering. Check out what the, uh, where is it? International Standard Version says, It was fitting for God, for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering as a part of his plan to glorify many children. Okay. Pioneer. Pioneer. Christian Standard Bible. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their, of their salvation perfect through sufferings. That is Hebrews 2 and 10, if you want to look it up. Why is that relevant on today? I'll tell you why. Because God has called some of y'all looking at me right now to pioneer. What does that mean? That means God has called some of y'all to do some stuff that nobody's ever seen before. God has called some of y'all to do some stuff that nobody's ever heard of before. And that's why some of you haven't embraced your destiny. And that's why some of you don't understand why am I always so persecuted? Why is the devil always after me? Why do people not get me? People don't get you because you're called a pioneer. That's why. That's not true for everybody. Everybody's not a pioneer. But some people are, like a lot of people in my family, because a lot of people in my family are entrepreneurs. But some of y'all look, looking at me right now, you're called a pioneer. You're going to be the first black person to do something, maybe in your area, in your field, in your family. You're going to be the first woman to do something in your area, in your field, in your family. You're going to be the first person of your age range to do something because some people are going to tell you, you're too young for all that. Some people are going to say, you're too old for all that. Some people are going to say, you missed your window, but God is still calling you. Some of you that hear me carefully, 
This is like Bishop Jake's anointing. Bishop T.D. Jakes has an anointing to minister to broken people and broken emotions. So Bishop Jakes, the core of what he does, the way the Spirit of God works through him, that's why he's so on point, because he stays in his core, is he will preach a sermon, he will prophesy a word, Bishop Jakes will say something that lives right where you live, that speaks exactly to your brokenness and shows you how to get from where you are to where God wants you to be. Okay, some of y'all looking at me right now, what you have is a ministry to the broken. And the very broken people that you're supposed to minister to are people where you used to do what they do. I stopped by to tell you, everybody not going to understand that. I'm going to get real deep. What about uh, porn stars? What about adult film stars? What if you made adult films? What if you had sex on camera at some point in your life? If people find that out, they're going to never let you forget that. What if you're a Christian now? Who's going to minister to you? Somebody that used to do that that came out of it. God's going to send them in your life. Everybody can't do that kind of ministry. But what if somebody once did adult films and they repented from that and they turned it around? They can relate to your struggle, but everybody's not going to accept that. Most people are going to condemn you. What if uh, you're dealing with alcohol? What if you were an alcoholic for like 20 years and you finally got clean and sober? God may take your life and turn you around and point you at people that are alcoholics now because you can relate. Everybody can relate. And you know that people are going to criticize you, condemn you and persecute you because of what you used to do. But that's why the Bible says when we become in Christ, we become new creatures. Old things are passed away. All things, behold, all things are become new. What if you used to do drugs? What if you did drugs most of your life and you finally hit a point where you got clean and sober? How do you know God's not going to take your life and send you right back to that drug community and tell those people, I got clean and sober through my faith? Jesus cleaned me by his blood. I now fill myself up with the word of God instead of drugs. I've now learned how to cope with life through prayer and scripture and hanging around the saints and seeking God and being filled with the Holy Ghost so that I don't have to depend on drugs to get me through. What if that's your testimony? Everybody not going to accept that. Everybody not going to understand that. But what if God calls you to start a ministry specifically for people that have substance abuse problems? That's why some of y'all haven't gotten into the fullness of your ministry because you keep hearing the Holy Ghost tell you to do stuff that you ain't never seen before. And it, it kind of trips you. You're like, oh, I never seen that before. Is God really talking to me? Yes. Yes, he's talking to you. Yes. What about sexual molestation? What have you been molested? And God calls you to turn around and set up a ministry for people that were molested as children because it happened to you and you made it. You got your life back together because Jesus healed your mind and Jesus healed your soul and Jesus healed your body. And Jesus set you on a path of living where if somebody looked at you, they couldn't tell you went through that. But there are people out there that are hurting. There are people out there that have been kidnapped, snatched out their house by grown folks. Who is God going to send in people to if you can't send them to someone that can relate? What if, because uh, uh, I can relate to this one, what if you're an artist and what if you have such a vision that when you're a child, nobody understands you? What if God has given you a vision for watercolors or oil paintings or, or poetry or a new type of dance the world hasn't seen before? or maybe a new type of music that people haven't heard before. People ain't gonna understand you. They're not gonna support you. They're gonna laugh at you. They're gonna tell you that you're crazy. They're going to say, no one's ever done that before. The epitome of that life is Jesus. Nobody ever was resurrected from the grave before. Other people were raised from the dead, but Jesus was resurrected from the grave. That means raised to die no more. Jesus actually beat poverty, sickness, death, old age, everything that there was to beat, he actually beat it. Nobody did that but him, okay? Now, there is casting out of demons in the Old Testament because when King Saul was possessed by the schizophrenic spirit, King David played his harp and the spirit of the Saul. So there's casting out demons, but Jesus is the first person to call demons by name. The Lord called demons by name. He taught us demonology by example, by calling unclean spirits by name. Because when you call out unclean spirits, if you want them to come all the way out, you got to call them by name. 
okay? Because they hide. If you don't know anything about demonology, they hide. And sometimes they hide in clusters. So when you're giving somebody deliverance, you have to call out a spirit of depression. Then you have to call out a spirit of promiscuity. Then you have to call out a spirit of suicide because all of those demons will try to piggyback and hide on each other. But if you get rid of one, if you haven't called the other ones out, they stay in there until you break their power too. Because suicide ain't the same spirit as depression. Depression can lead to suicide. Promiscuity ain't the same spirit, all that. You got to call them by name. If you, don't, if you don't know anything about casting out demons, that's the way demonology works. But, you know, that's a very deep subject. You know, I don't have time to go into all that. But I'm just giving you an, an, an example of how the stuff that Jesus did, nobody had ever seen it before. The, the Lord was so unique as a rabbi. He did things that were counterculture, like talking to women, like treating women like he loved them just as much as he loved the men because he did. Like talking to Samaritans because Samaritans were, cons were the lower class cousins of the Jews. So in other words, proper to do people didn't talk to Samaritans. Uh, hanging out with fishermen, hanging out with Matthew, a former tax collector. Um, when the woman with the issue of blood reached out and touched the rabbi, as a woman, she wasn't supposed to touch the rabbi. That's why when the Lord turned around and said, who touched me? She's afraid. She's like, oh, Lord, because she was desperate for that healing. But she knew she wasn't supposed to touch no rabbi. She wasn't supposed to do that. Okay? Uh, that's why when they saw Jesus talking to the woman at the well, when Peter and them came back with some food, their mouths dropped over. The Bible said they were astonished because he was talking to that woman. That woman was a Samaritan. She's a woman, and she was a multi-divorcee. The Lord said, you've had five husbands, and the man you're sleeping with now ain't your husband. And the Lord still respected her. The Lord still loved her. When the Lord went into a house, there was a woman who wept and washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And the Pharisees, the religious people said, if you knew what kind of woman that was, you wouldn't let her touch you. And the Lord said, y'all have been giving me no affection. So in other words, a woman that had lived a promiscuous life, a woman that had a bad reputation, Jesus didn't mind uh, when she was trying to show him affection because he was such an unorthodox rabbi they didn't know what to do with Jesus. Then he started talking about stuff about how you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, using his body and blood, uh, starting to give us uh, analogies and metaphors uh, for bread and wine, which is what we do on First Sunday, communion and Easter, that the bread represents his body broken on the, the cross and the wine represents his blood shed on the cross for our redemption. And so we do that in remembrance of the fact that he was broken and poured out for us. But when he started introducing those concepts to the people around him, they did not, it sounded like cannibalism. The Lord said that after he fed the 5,000 men plus the women and children, when he took the two fish and the five barley loaves and he made all that food, that's when he started talking about, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then people were like, we don't like that Jesus. <laughs> then people was like, like, get your coat. They was like, Julia, <laughs> get your coat, get your hat. And they started bouncing because they liked Jesus as long as he was handing out free fish sandwiches. As soon as the Lord started challenging the way they thought, they was like, yeah, okay. Yeah, they were like, mm -mm -mm. and it was only his 12 left. And the Lord said, y'all want to go away too? And Peter like, where are we going to go? And the Lord explained to them what he meant by what he said, because the Lord was so off the chain. The reason I'm belaboring that point is because some of y'all listening to me right now, have been called by God to be off the chain. And you've been scared all this time because you God's calling you to do something that you've never seen anybody do. God's calling you to minister in a way you've never seen anybody minister. God's calling you to understand a group of people that everybody else hates, but you used to be one of them. And Jesus Christ, turn your life around. Jesus Christ gave you a 180 and you're not what you used to be. Who's going to do that for those people that are still stuck in? Can you understand that? What if you write an article that changes people's lives and nobody expected that kind of article to come out of you? What if you sing a song that changes people's lives and nobody expected that song to come out of you? What if you run for office? What if you become a congressman? What if you become an alderman? What if you get yourself in a position where you can affect the laws? Uh, right now in Evanston, Illinois, Evanston, Illinois is becoming the first city in the country to offer reparations to black people for slavery on their property. 
Guess who sponsored that legislation? Uh, uh, alderman named Robin Rue Simmons. She grew up in my church. She was in my choir when she was young. She was in the, the youth gospel choir. Okay, and she's grown up to be someone that is creating legislation that's changing people's lives. Okay, she's pioneering reparations for property. Okay, look it up. Look up reparations in Evanston, Illinois, and you'll see Robin Rue Simmons. Uh, we grew up in the same church. She was in my choir. She's grown up to write laws. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what God is saying to some of y'all. And God been saying that to some of y'all for years. And you've been afraid. Well, I stopped by on this Resurrection Sunday to set you free, to let you know, to give you confirmation through the Holy Ghost that that's God talking to you. And you might have to do some stuff that nobody's ever seen before. My pastor, Apostle John Eckhart, when he got into the apostolic and the prophetic back in the 90s, a whole lot of people thought he was crazy. Now, He's known all over the world. He has traveled all over the world a hundred times over trying to usher people into the apostolic and the prophetic. But it wasn't like that when he started. If you're a Christian that takes the word of God seriously, then you know we're supposed to cast out demons. There are a whole lot of believers that don't want to deal with demonology, which has always amazed me because the Lord said that's part of the signs that follow. And you need deliverance, too, if you didn't know that. You need to have a regular time where if there's anything in your life, you break it off in the name of Jesus, because you can accumulate dirt. You might have done something, or you might have confessed something. You might have authorized something with your mouth. You might have been around some people you don't know. But just like your body accumulates dirt by living and you must shower, your spirit can accumulate things by living. And you need the blood of Jesus. You need the word of God. You need the filling of the Holy Ghost and you need deliverance. You need to learn how to break things off you. For example, if you've been having trouble sleeping, or if you find yourself in a bad mood all the time, or if you find yourself thinking suicidal thoughts, that's the devil. And you need to learn how to rebuke it because there's a demon named Sheshai that speaks to you in your own voice. Did you know that? There's a demon that's so familiar with you, he can say stuff and it sounds like it's you. Until you learn how to rebuke that, then you see that stuff snap off you. You realize that ain't you thinking that, that's the devil. That's how organized the kingdom of darkness is, if you didn't know that. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's why sometimes you had them crazy thoughts and you say, now, I know I'm not thinking that, but that's a demon. That's a familiar spirit. His name is Sheshai. That's in the Bible. He's speaking to you with what sounds like your own voice, trying to make you think uh, a very common one is trying to make you hate God. Whenever you have them thoughts of trying to turn you against God, that's the devil. If God was so good, as soon as you hear the word, if, that's the devil. Because the devil said to Jesus, if thou be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. That's the devil. If God was so good, how come you going through this? How come this? How come that? That's the devil. But he tries to make you think, you thinking it, to turn you against God. It's subtle. It's subtle. But that's very, very real. There's an example of what I mean about how you hear me say all the time, well, you need your own prophetic walk with God. You need to learn how to commune with the Holy Ghost within you. You need to learn the word of God, you know, because this is the kind of stuff we fight. You see that? Okay, so back to the scripture. That Jesus is the pioneer. The pioneer. See, so that word is for some of y'all listening to me right now. That God has been calling you to do some stuff that has never been seen before. Ain't no church ministry have it. There, there ain't no definition for it. And God, God put it in your heart. Years ago, years ago, I stopped by to set you free on this resurrection Sunday to tell you to stop being afraid. Go ahead on and do that thing. Go ahead on and do that. If nobody's ever done it before, it's because you've been called like Jesus to pioneer. And yes, they're going to persecute you. And yes, they're going to laugh at you. And yes, they're going to belittle you. And yes, they're going to tell you that you're crazy. So what? So what? So what? God is going to do a mighty work in your life, and God is going to bring life to many. Okay? Don't we still feed off the words in the Bible? And, and don't we still feed off the words of Apostle Paul, wrote all those letters, Apostle John? Don't we still read their words? Okay, you think they understood everything when they wrote the Bible? They wrote because the Holy Ghost told them to write. But all these years later, we're still being blessed. All those Psalms that David and Asaph and Solomon and Moses wrote. David didn't write all the Psalms. All that music, don't we still read that? Because they did what the Holy Ghost told them to do and that's what God is telling you to do. 
Okay, so let me get back to my original scripture. It says, let us run with endurance the race set out before us. That word endurance means endurance, steadfastness, patient waiting for. It means cheerful endurance or constancy. Very important. Let me read those possible translations again. This is why you have to study the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, excuse me, Hebrew and Greek, because the, the meanings are broader than in English. Um, <clears throat> so let us run with endurance. The race set out for us, that word endurance there means endurance, steadfastness, patient waiting for, cheerful endurance, constancy. What does that mean? And besides all the other stuff I've said, this is another point of emphasis the Holy Ghost wanted to, me to release on you today, that you have to hang in there. Why is, so, is it so important that you have to hang in there? Because some things happen overnight, like when Jesus cursed the fig tree. Some things happen in a couple of months. Some things happen in a year or two. Some things might take a decade. Some things might take decades. Some things you might start in your life and your children have to continue. And some things might not come to fruition until three, 400 years after you did. Like you planted it in your life and did nobody understand what was going on. And three or 400 years after you did, then people get it. How do I know that's true? Because that's what the Lord did with his life. You do understand. If you don't understand, I'll explain it to you really quickly. The reason that the 12 men that followed Jesus, the reason that they followed him is because they thought the Lord was going to overthrow the Roman government. The reason, One of the reasons for that is because it was said that Messiah would be the son of David, meaning King David, the one that killed Goliath, the one that uh, wrote all the music, the one that danced before God with all of his might, uh, that king, the greatest king of Israel, they said that Messiah would be the son of David. What they thought that meant was that Jesus or that Messiah would operate like David did. They were expecting Messiah to, stay, to start and stage a revolution. That's why when they came to arrest Jesus, you know, they always preach that his 12 disciples left him. He, and they ran huh? And they ran from the Lord. Yeah, well, you might want to try to read the Bible. What they did was they fought. Peter fought. When they came to arrest Jesus, Peter took out his sword and cut off the ear of Malchus. That's not men running. When they came to arrest Jesus, then men fought. You know why? Because they were saying, this is it. This is what we've been waiting on. They expected the Lord to do what David would have done, which was take a sword to the Roman government and deliver Israel from the Roman oppression physically through warfare, through a revolution in the streets. So when they came to arrest Jesus, that's why Peter pulled out his knife and said, finally, because the men did not run at first, they fought, okay? Then the Lord said, put up your sword, Peter. And then the Lord made them understand that he was gonna allow himself to be arrested. Then they ran, because then they was like, well, y'all ain't arresting me. <laughs> then they bounced because they didn't understand what the Lord was doing. The Lord was going to the cross so he could deal with the larger enemies. People today still don't understand that about Jesus' death because the Lord switched strategies. All while the Lord was walking around feeding and teaching and preaching and prophesying, he roared like a lion and nobody ever defeated Jesus. But when it came to fight the higher enemies, the way to beat them was to become a lamb, become a sacrifice. So he took the penalty in his body so he could bury it once and for all, but then the grave couldn't hold him because all that penalty was not because of anything he did. So he came back and laughed at him and said, now that I'm resurrected, now all that believe in me can get the benefit of my righteousness. Now they can live forever and you can no longer hold them. So he tricked them. He beat the enemy at his own game. So when Jesus was stretched out on the cross, they thought they had him, but he was actually paying the penalty. So he was dealing with poverty sickness, demon possession, every kind of disease, uh, death itself, the grave, hell, the devil. He was dealing with the higher enemies. That's what his crucifixion was about. He had to become a lamb to win there. And his friends didn't understand that. They thought he was gonna fight. You understand? Why am I saying all that? I'm saying all that for two reasons. Number one, because God doesn't always do things the way you want him to. You're gonna have to get used to that. That's why you hear me work so hard 
<clears throat> on my No More Genie series. You're going to have to get rid of that genie concept of God where you just call God and rub the lamp and you think the Lord got to do what you say. No, no, he don't bow down before us. We bow down before him. And God is not always going to do things the way you want, when you want, how you thought. You cannot presume to tell God what to do. You cannot presume to know the will of God. You have to ask him. One. Number two, and that's because <clears throat> things don't always play out the way you thought they were going to play out. One of my best, oh Lord, one of my best examples about that is marriage. Because we are always like in this all fired hurry to get married. And then once you get married, you find out that there's so much more involved in being married and making a marriage work than you might have even known. But you didn't prepare yourself. You rushed into it. We do that a lot. And then, then your life ends up not playing out at all like you thought. OK, or you make a decision that has lifelong consequences and your life doesn't play out at all like you thought. OK, so that's why the Bible says and I got I have to wrap up. That's why the Bible says we have to run with patience. We have to run with endurance. We have to run consistently. That's why I'm on my post every Sunday. Uh, if I got a thousand people watching me, if I got one person watching me, if I got no people watching me, I understand that the Holy Spirit of God is going to use the words he releases through me to his glory, to his purposes. And I'll never fully understand in this life what that looks like. Because you never know who's looking at you. You never know who's watching you. You never know who's being blessed by your ministry. You never will know in this life. The thing to do is do what the Lord told you to do. And the rest is up to him. It's all for you once you get what you want back. And so I'm trying to encourage those of you that are watching to me, watching me now, those of you listening to me live, those of you that are watching this on the replay, that God is trying to tell you that you got to hang in there with the race he set before you. If you're an entrepreneur, I know a little something about being an entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is trying and failing and trying and failing and trying and failing until you get it right. It's not the same as being an employee, having a regular job. Okay? So some of y'all have entrepreneurial dreams. You have to try and fail and try and fail and try and fail until you get it right. And then once you get it right, you're going to have to know what to do with your harvest when you get it. Because a whole lot of people have no plan for success. Did you know that? A whole lot of people have no idea what to do with success if they got it. Because if you fail, you get up and you can try again. What are what, what you going to do if something blow up? Do you have PR strategies? Do you know how to talk to people? Do you know how to be interviewed? Do you know what colors are good against your skin? Do you know who you can trust, who you can't trust? Do you know how to invest your money? Do you know how to lock in gains from the stock market? If you had a steady increase of gains, would you know when to pull your money out to lock your gains in? Do you know how to write up a contract? Do you know how to read a contract? Do you know all that? What if you succeeded? What if you blew up tomorrow? Do you know what to do? Do you ever think about that? See what I mean? So that's what I mean when I say the Holy Ghost is trying to let you know to hang in there with your race because your race don't look like other people's. Your race doesn't look like other people. Your race doesn't look like other people. It doesn't look like other. Stop comparing yourself. Stop looking around you. Because if you're a pioneer, there's nobody around you doing what you're doing. And one more time. I'll give you this quick example, then I'll be done. Everywhere I go, no, we didn't, haven't done convention circuits in person since COVID hit. And I really miss doing convention circuits. Because there's an author convention circuit I would do every year where I go to different conventions and sell my books. Every place I go, you know what they ask me? They ask me, what's it like to be a black science fiction writer? And I I forget, I, that's not salient to me. I'm a writer who's also black. But when they see me, they say, what's it like to be a black science fiction writer? What's that like? And I'm like, it's writing. I mean, you know, do I have like, you know, a big book of, a big book of uh, blackness? Big book of blackness that I just read from and, you know, Here's like all the Negro scrolls and <laughs> that kind of thing. Because they keep saying, you know, that you're black and ain't there many black authors in science fiction, which is true. OK, so maybe I'm doing something they've never seen before. You see that they're not used to coming to sci fi convention conventions and meeting authors and seeing a black face. That's new for them. That's not new for me because I had a black face my whole life. So that's not news to me, but I guess it's news to them. You see that? So in that area, I'm some level of pioneering. And that's my point. And so that's why the Holy Ghost wants to stress to you today 
that the thing to do is to run your race. Stay in your lane, but you got to be patient and you got to be consistent. You got to show up when nobody's looking. You got to do what God tells you to do when there's no applause, there's no crowd, there's no support. You got to, every time God tells you to do something, you got to get in your lane and do your thing, do your thing. Why? Because some of that may not be manifest until like 100 years from now. 100 years from now, there might be somebody, if we still have YouTube 100 years from now, if they're still in America 100 years from now, that would be 2121. This is 2021. In 2121, if they have old archives of YouTube videos, how do I know somebody's not going to watch this video and get encouraged? But if I had put it out there, it wouldn't be out there for them to watch. You see that? How do I know that? I don't know. I'm just trying to be obedient to what the Holy Ghost is telling me to do. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. Hang in there. Be consistent. Be constant. Persevere. Just like Jesus had to. Because if you're a pioneer, nobody's going to get you. Nobody's going to understand you. And you can't not do with your life what God told you to do just because other people misunderstand you. You've got to go for it. Okay? All right. Amen. Thank you to those of you that watch me live. Uh, if you want to bless me financially, I'll put my Zell on the screen. You can just send that to my uh, personal email. Uh, people have asked me before, how do we bless you financially? Because uh, they want to support my ministry. I got some my Zell, so I'll put it in the chat. So you can just send it straight to my personal email. I use Zell because I found out some things about some other apps. Zell doesn't charge any fees either way. Zell is a part of the banking system, so they don't charge you and they don't charge me. So if you want to bless me financially, you can send it to my Zell right there. Remember, I told you that my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach. So every video, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. So what I'm going to ask you to do, the one thing I'm going to ask you to do today is I'm going to ask you to go to my 150 Hymns Projects page and like that page and sign up for my newsletter. So I'm putting that down in the chat. Uh, I have a project where I'm writing one hymn for every song. I'll put it on the screen. So I'm writing one hymn for every song. So I want you to go to that page on Facebook, like that page. And then there's a sign up there because I always let people know when I have a new hymn. That's the first Friday of every month. So I just did it last Friday. So like that page because when you like stuff and when you share stuff, then Facebook and YouTube, uh, the algorithm takes over and then they start suggesting to other people. And that's what helps the channel grow. And that's what helps me increase my reach. And the reason I want to increase my reach is because whenever the Lord gives me something prophetic to share, we want as many people as possible to hear it so the body of Christ can be edified because you don't know who needs to hear the word of God. That's something the Lord taught, taught me about prophetics a long time ago. He was like, you got to learn to trust me. You just say what I tell you to say because he was like, you don't know who's in the audience. And when you're a prophet, a whole lot of people, you're never going to see them again. When you minister to some people prophetically, you are never going to see them. Some people, you are never going to see them again in this life. So you got to say, that's why God trains us the way he does. You got to say what the Lord is telling you to say. Because some of the people, you ain't going to never see them again. So that's why I want to increase my reach so that when the Holy Spirit is speaking through me and gives me something to say, as many people as possible can hear it so they can get blessed by what the Spirit of God is bringing. Okay? Uh, okay, wait, I feel a prophetic word coming. Uh, so go to my uh, hymn space. Hold on. For behold, my people, the days have come where I am dividing the wheat from the chaff, where I'm looking for those that are serious about serving me, that are going to go forward and be obedient. They are going to allow me to be the Lord of their lives in all things. For I have rewards that you cannot imagine. I have rewards that you literally can't imagine in your mind or into your heart. For those that love me, keep my commandments and serve me. And those war rewards are not just in this life, but they are eternal for the life to come. And they will never fade. For when I give you something, it never loses its luster. It never stops shining. It's going to shine forever. So those that don't want to listen to me and follow me are going to be shut out as the foolish virgins. They're not going to know everything I'm doing. They're not going to keep step with me. But for those of you that love me and fear my name and stay filled with the Holy Ghost, I have so much I'm going to show you in the days that come. I'm going to open up my treasures of visions, prophecy, revelations, finances, understanding, influence, favor, and power upon you. 
because you have served me faithfully and because you believe me and because you heed my voice, says the spirit of the living God. Wow. Okay. That blessed my soul right there. I'm going to go back and watch that myself so I can get all the details. Wow. Signs and wonders and miracles are going to follow that prophetic word. So receive it. Go back and watch it. We'll watch this video from the top so you can get all the details. But that prophetic word that was just released, go back and watch that in detail. That's what I'm going to do. Because, because that means that, that all that stuff that the Holy Ghost said is coming up. Remember I told you how the Lord told us there was some good stuff coming in the days ahead? He just confirmed that with some more detail. That there's some more stuff that Jesus is going to release to those that have been believing and obeying and following him. Signs, wonders, miracles, prophetics, revelation, wisdom, understanding, money, favor, influence. Wow. Okay, so I'm excited, um, I'm edified, I'm encouraged by that word. So thank you to all of you that watch me live. Thank you to all of you that are watching on the replay. Thank you to all of you that like and shared the video. And thank you to all of you that blessed me financially by sending me a donation. And thank you to all of you that liked my 150 hymns page. And yes, I do have some more gospel music coming. Don't worry, I write all kinds of Christian music. I have workout music where you can get your sweat on to something talk about Jesus because a lot of people have told me they like to work out, but they don't want to listen to secular music. So I have gospel workout music where you can get your sweat on and it's talking about Jesus. I got all, I got rap. I got all kinds of music. Okay. So don't worry. All right. Thank you. God bless. Happy Resurrection Sunday. I'm so happy to be alive and to be in the service of the Lord on today. Okay. So I'll be here this Thursday at seven o'clock PM for my next installment of No More Genies. I'm on my new series, Who Is God? Part three. And uh, so that'll be this Thursday at 7 p.m. right here on Facebook Live. Then I'll be back next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my next weekly live prophetic work. Okay, amen, God bless you. God bless you. And remember, we have to run our individual race with patience, endurance, consistency, because there's some rewards that Jesus is gonna give us. Amen and God bless. To threaten, and sickness is his weapon to fill my days with strife and cutting.